Hello, this is Roger Royce, and I'm here to talk to you about Startup Law 101, how to avoid the legal pitfalls that could doom your startup. So <clears throat> I'm a partner, a corporate partner with the law firm of Haynes Boone in Palo Alto, California, which is the heart of Silicon Valley. I work with emerging growth and venture capital. That means I represent startups on formation, financing, commercial contracts, and exit, including M&A or IPO. Today, uh, I also represent investors uh, in startups, and I do some closely held company work as well for companies that are not going to take venture capital investment, but are just going to follow a more traditional path. But today, we're going to talk about legal issues for startups and kind of the top legal issues that you need to be concerned about. Uh, this discussion is based loosely on some of the concepts discussed in my book, 10,000 Startups, Legal Strategies for Startup Success. And if you're watching this video, you're also going to get an email with a copy of my slides and a, cop a digital copy of the book. So you can explore any of these issues in more detail if you'd like. And of course, you're always welcome to email me, uh, roger.royce at haynesboone.com. Um, <clears throat> I want you to know that uh, I also have a podcast. It's called 10,000 Startups. Uh, the uh, link will be in my email. I hope that you will subscribe every week. We have original content from a different speaker who is an expert or a specialist rather in an area of startup law that you probably want to know about if you're an entrepreneur, uh, a founder, an investor, uh, or even somebody who is otherwise associated with the startup ecosystem. So you'll want to take a look at that. It's a short, quick podcast, 20 minutes of tips. Every Monday we come out with original content uh, by an industry expert. So with that, why don't we just go right to the presentation? Okay, Startup Law 101, how to avoid legal pitfalls that could doom your startup. <clears throat> So the first one that I want to talk about, and this is a big one, and these are in no particular order of importance or priority. Any one of these could be huge issues. Any one of these could be issues that we, you know, that might not be so huge. But the first one I want to talk about <clears throat> is a big one. It is a very big one. It's claims by prior employers. Now, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> So here in Silicon Valley, where I practice, and pretty much everywhere in the world, I think, if you're in this space, because uh, Silicon Valley has become more of a, a concept without geography these days, a lot of people have side hustles, right? They have their weekend and night project where they're building something that may or may not be related to their current day job. Hopefully it's not related to their day job, all right? Because if it is too related, to their day job, their current employer may have a claim, not only to the intellectual property that the company is using, but to the company itself, but have a claim to that opportunity. Now, here in California, where I practice, there's a very clear roadmap as to how to avoid those claims. And I can tell you, it is the very first question I ask a new startup company client when they come in and sit down in my office and tell me that they'd like to form a company. I ask them, I say, look, do you have a job? Okay, that's great. Because if you do, you very likely signed what we call a CIAIA, it's a confidential information agreement and invention assignment. And you very likely have assigned your rights to whatever you do for that new company. And even if you haven't, they'll have common law rights anyway. Uh, <clears throat> but you've assigned your, we're going to assume that you've assigned your rights to the maximum extent of the law. Fortunately, here in California, the maximum extent of the law is actually pretty is actually been narrowed by statute. We have a labor code section that basically limits what an employer can take from somebody. And keep in mind, California has a philosophy of employee mobility. I mean, it may be one of the reasons we have a Silicon Valley in, in California. It's because people can leave their current big company employers and go start their new small company startup. That's Labor Code 2870. It's attached to my slides. You can take a look at it at your leisure, but really just keep a handful of things in mind. Uh, the first two are super easy. First three are easy, in fact. Um, you got to do this on your own time. If you're building this company 
while you're being paid by your employer, your employer may have a claim for whatever it is that you're building. Secondly, you need to do it with your own facilities. So for, for most companies, that means your own computer. But let's say you're a biotech company, that means your own lab, right? You don't want to use the employer's facilities. And you must assume complete transparency in this process as well, uh, because uh, the employer does have a right to whatever is on an employer-owned computer. So they're going to figure this out. Just assume that. So your own time and your own facilities, nights and weekends, when you're not at work, when you're at home, that's fine. That's, and those are very clear guidelines. Pretty easy to comply with those. Third one, doesn't result from work performed for the employer. That's another pretty easy one to comply with, right? If your employer hired you to build widgets and you build a widget, well, that widget belongs to your employer. If you happen to be building a widget and you came up with a gadget while working, building the widget still belongs to your employer. Their agreements probably say so. So that's a pretty clear one as well. Um, it's that fourth one that's troublesome whether it's related to the employer's business or not. And just think of it in terms of fairness. If, if I'm in uh, the widget business and I hire you to come help me build my widgets and you build something that's closely related to it, I maybe should have a right to that because I hired you to do this. So that's a tough one. And that's one where I can't give you a real clear guidance. Um, I can tell you that there is a ton of case law out here in California that can give you an idea of what that means. But if you're out there, you know, forging new pathways in the law, then we failed. We don't want to be that person. Let somebody else make new law or define the limits of the law. Instead, uh, I'd rather that you go into this building something that you establish early and clearly is not related to your employer's business. Now, as I said, best practices, um, the employer is going to have you sign a confidential information agreement and invention assignment where you agree to assign all of your inventions uh, within these four guidelines that I mentioned to your employer that basically result from work done for the employer. Um, and you, when you form your new company, you're going to ask everybody that works for you to sign that exact same agreement. Don't forget to do that. If you forget to do that, uh, you might have a fight on your hands. You might not have sole 100% ownership of your intellectual property. You might not be financeable. Okay. And I've seen companies tank, completely tank not get financing for one reason. They did not have these agreements in place. So make sure you get those in place and make sure they're well drafted and well considered. By the way, on that point, that means every one of these agreements says here, we're going to attach a schedule which the employee is bringing to the new company. And on that schedule, we're going to carve out the stuff that belongs to the employee. And if it's not on the schedule, and then we're going to assume it belongs to the employer. That's how it's usually done. And also, people usually don't pay any attention to that schedule. I think that's a bad practice. I think it's a good idea to put something on it. Uh, because if I'm the employer, I want some proof that you know, we took it seriously and we actually looked at it. Uh, and if I'm the employee, I want a document that says, hey, this was mine coming into this. We all agreed. Uh, the second thing. When a new person joins your startup, because at some point you're going to go from employee to employer, hopefully, when they join your startup, you know, you're going to want everybody that joins to sign representations that they're not taking any of their former employees' intellectual property, i.e. IP, right? So you just make them give you a representation to that effect. Uh, and that'll give you a little bit of comfort. It's not a guarantee. It's not an insurance company policy, but it gives you some comfort that you've done everything you can to, you've done your due diligence to ensure that you're not stealing somebody's IP with your new company. Uh, and plus you want that so that if you ever get a claim, you get a demand letter from somebody like me, you can go back and say, hey, we did everything we could. We've even got promises from all our employees that they didn't take anything from anybody else. And then finally, and this might be the hardest one, avoid social media. I know you want to go brag about your new company that you're working on, uh, but if you have any ambiguity at all around that fourth prong, not related to employer's business, um, you probably don't want to be broadcasting that on LinkedIn. Uh, just a word to the wise, I know that's the first place I go look uh, when I want to find out what somebody's up to. All right, let's move right along to the importance of documentation. 
Uh, so in my book, 10,000 Startups, and even more so in my earlier book, Dead on Arrival, How to Avoid the Legal Mistakes That Could Kill Your Startup, we talked a lot about this issue. This is by far the number one biggest startup company issue, and it's getting worse, not better, right? My entire career, and I've been doing this a long time, uh, this has been the number one issue, and it is an issue around the world where, wherever you go, people have this issue. Why is it? Because you as a business person, you, you already probably consider these formalities to be a little bit silly, right? They're formalities. There's paper, you know, it's, it, you got to sign the paper, you know, you got to get signatures, you got to keep copies of it. It just seems a little silly. And I totally get that. But it is so spectacularly important. Um, the reason it's important is that it, for a couple of reasons, number one, it quite clearly defines what your deal is so people can't change their mind. And if you don't clearly define it up front in writing, people are going to change their mind. So you might have agreed that you were 50-50 owners, but by the time if you wait a year to go document it, somebody might decide they should be 60 and you should be 40 by that time, right? People will change their mind. You might have decided that you will have vesting on your shares. But if you're not, and you might have even agreed to it, but if you don't put it in writing, people are going to forget that uh, when it comes time to dismiss them and you don't have anything in writing uh, and you're asking them to then agree to something that's against their interest. So it's really important to get this up front early on when everybody's friendly and agreeable and willing to work on it. Um, I can't tell you how many companies I've seen uh, where they've got a great idea, they've managed to hit the market at the right time. They've managed to attract investors. Uh, they've just got just everything is perfect. Everything is right. The stars have aligned, but you know, we're all friends and we just not didn't get around to putting anything in writing and your company's dead. You're done. Start over, blow it up and go your separate ways and each start that company and see how far you get that. So it's a big, big issue. So sorry to belabor it, but it is such a, it is the number one company killer as far as I'm concerned. People are not documenting things. Second thing I want you to know, why we as lawyers, why are we so concerned about that? Well, number one, it keeps people from arguing otherwise. But number two, if you get in a dispute with somebody over your agreement or, or really any dispute where there's a writing, <clears throat> You're going to go to court. They're going to, going to go to court. You're going to be in front of the jury or the judge. You're going to tell the story that best fits you. They're going to tell their version of the story, which is going to surprise you how different it is. Um, and a jury's going to hear all of this, but they're not taking any recordings of that into the jury room with them. What they are taking with them is what's in writing, the documents. They go right into the jury room with them. And when they make a decision, they're going to have that right in front of them it carries a lot of weight, it's very, very important. And even if you never get to a trial over an issue like this, and I hope you never do, if you do, then we've done something wrong, um, <clears throat> somebody's done something wrong, then uh, everybody knows that though. Everybody knows that the documents will be important on the back end if you ever have to litigate it. So it's really important to get stuff in writing and do it very soon while everyone's agreeable before you put a lot of time and effort into something. All right, common issues. Number one, equity ownership, right? That is the number one issue because people tend to lose interest or gain interest or contribution shift and people's expectations of what's fair and what they should have change as well. That's gotta be in writing right from the start. It's surprising how little writing it takes to be legally binding. Just get something, just get a simple agreement. Let me give you some that are less obvious. <clears throat> Loans or contributions. A lot of times you have one party putting in uh, sweat, <laughs> services, intellectual property, know-how, customer relationships, et cetera, et cetera, everything but cash. And you have another party that's putting a little less of that first stuff, intangible stuff, and a little more cash because they got the money and they need to get things going. Well, are they loaning that money to the company? Or is that just their contribution for their equity stake, right? Because you might have very different ideas. Or are they expecting it all to convert into preferred stock down the road when you do a financing? You all might have very different ideas. And my expectation is that the, 
money partner is going to have the expectation that it's going to turn into whatever gives him the highest return. So make sure you document that. That's the one thing people hardly ever do. Money goes in and they don't even have a board. It's super simple, simple board resolution saying we hereby accept this as a contribution to capital without the issuance of stock, or we hereby accept this as a loan, all right, et cetera. Third one, vesting. You got to spell that out. You can't just assume everybody in the Valley vests, so therefore you vest. It's not how it works. The vesting only happens by agreement. What do we mean by vesting? That's the idea that somebody earns into their shares, right? So we have, a, say we have 10 million shares authorized and we're gonna issue, I don't know, 3 million to each of our two founders, um, but they have to vest over three years. Pretty common stuff. Okay, 3 million shares, three years, that means I earn 1 million shares each year. If I leave after the first year, I gotta give 2 million back and I've got 1 million left over. That's got to be in writing. That's got to be by agreement. Uh, and make sure you get that writing up front. If you don't have that in writing, then they own 3 million shares, even though they've left the day after they got the shares. And your company is dead on arrival. It's non-financeable. Nobody's going to, well, probably not financeable unless you can renegotiate something uh, with the non-active founder. So get that in writing. A couple other things about documentation, which I kind of put on this slide, is uh, be careful about downloading forms from the internet. Uh, you may think that they are just startup standard, um, but you will find a nasty surprise sometimes uh, with what's buried in these documents uh, and how investor friendly some of them could be when you thought they were startup friendly or at least neutral. Uh, be aware of the online incorporation tools they can get you in a lot of trouble. I'm not saying don't do it. I like them. It kind of weeds out the tourists. But um, if you're really serious about your company, you'll have a lawyer look over your documents to make sure you haven't made any big mistakes. And I have seen people make spectacular mistakes uh, by doing it themselves. All right. Uh, let's see. What else? Comments. Napkins as agreements. I have seen napkins used as agreements. Um, I had a guy come into my office one time with a cocktail napkin back when people used to do that. And uh, it was a promise, a signed promise on a napkin. I'm not making this up, giving him 5% of the company. And this turned out to be a very substantial company. That napkin was worth a fortune. You know, I'm glad he didn't use it to, you know, to blow his nose or something. Uh, and the other thing people... People, oftentimes I say, send me the agreements and people send me a bunch of unsigned drafts. Yeah, well, okay, you know, that's nice, but I want the signed agreement. You know, I don't I don't know what to make of that unsigned, you know, draft. It's not an agreement. Uh, it might be evidence, you know, if you can prove you relied on it, but um, we're trying to avoid problems on the front end, not trying to create problems and then figuring out a way to, you know, get around them on the back end. Let's keep moving. Vesting we talked about. Oh, so I'm not going to repeat it, uh, but I do want to talk about a couple of things uh, about investing that I want you to know. Um, first of all, like I said, three years is pretty common. Four years is very common for vesting restrictions, but get over the idea that you're going to be fully vested in three or four years and never have to worry about it again. Uh, in my experience, every investor on every round kind of revisits this issue. And uh, I mean, not always, but often. And they may want you to unvest. Uh, kind of depends how hot your company are and how important you are to the company. Uh, but oftentimes, you'll have to reset that vesting schedule again and again and again, meaning you start all over and we have a whole new negotiation. So just keep that in mind. And the reason why, by the way, you might be thinking, well, well why is it? Well, I'll tell you why. Because it takes a company a lot longer than that three or four year vesting schedule these days to exit. Not always, but... On, on average, it takes longer to exit now than it did, you know, 25 years ago <laughs> when everybody was four-year vesting because everybody went public in four years if they were going to exit at all. Yeah, it's just not like that anymore. Uh, but that fossil, that three and four-year vesting schedule fossil has stuck around, uh, even though companies stick around a lot longer than they used to, uh, to the annoyance of many of us who invest in them. Um, so you got to keep the founders along, you know, to get them to an exit. So what do you do? You say, look, I know you're fully vested, but you're, you're another four years to exit. We need you to unvest, start all over. 
single versus double trigger. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. It relates to the concept of acceleration. Acceleration means that something will happen where all of your unvested shares suddenly vest. For example, uh, there's two, really two things that we're talking about here. One is a sale of the company or a change of control. We have a change of control. I should be fully vested because I did my job, right? So got, got the company sold, got a return for the investors. So when I get my acquiring company stock in exchange for my startup company stock, that stock should be fully vested. That's the argument. Um, another single trigger is if I get, I'm the founder, I'm unvested. If I get terminated without cause, you just decided you don't like me anymore. Or you found somebody better. Um, I should get full vesting because that's not my fault. That's your bad, not mine. That's a single trigger. Rarely do you see those anymore, which you oftentimes see for your high level executives, not everybody, just the very high level people who are smart enough to ask for it is double trigger. Meaning that if both of those things happen within a certain amount of time, six months to a year, then we'll go ahead and invest all the invested shares, right? So if we have a sale of the, if I get terminated without cause within six months of a sale of the business, for example, then I get full vesting because that could happen. And uh, at that point, uh, it seems fair to give that to certain people. And that's a negotiated term, by the way. Probably, you know, oftentimes we'll negotiate to times at six months or is it a year? And we'll negotiate how much gets accelerated in that case. Advisor vesting, um, remember what I said about three and four year vesting, three years for founders, four years for optionees. For advisors, typically two, typically two, because an advisor is a special sort of person to your company. They're there for a very specific purpose. A little industry expertise, maybe technical expertise on something you're working on. Maybe they're going to help introduce you to customers, introduce you to investors. Be careful of that one if they're not a broker dealer that is registered. But in those cases, they better be done with their thing within two years. So two-year vesting for advisors, typically. Uh, you might Google Zipcar. This is the company that did a very successful exit, but they went through a lot of pain because they had two founders. They didn't have vesting. They had to go renegotiate uh, the vesting later on with investors and the founders. Later on, one of the founders said, I wish we'd had vesting at the front end. I probably would have got more money out of this, at least would have saved myself a lot of pain. Um, there's some tax stuff around it. There's a thing called an 83B election. It has to be filed within 30 days of the date of the transfer of property. That means when stock gets issued, not when options get granted, when stock gets issued, um, I go into this in detail in my book. I won't talk a lot about it now. I will just tell you that it is spectacularly important and it for unvested stock, and it must be done within 30 days. And, um, you know, and a lot of times people will assume the company's going to take care of them and do it for them. Don't assume that because very few companies do that anymore. And then they finally figure out and it's late and can you fix it? The answer is maybe. Maybe, you know, we might have a hack for that, but that is definitely going to require legal counsel, preferably a tax lawyer. Sometimes we see vesting imposed on financing. Sometimes we see vesting imposed on M&A. You'll find some discussion about the different tax consequences when that happens in my book. Let's move on to the time constraints. Tax planning. Startups typically don't do any, all right? Uh, they're going to be a Delaware C Corp, and that's the end of the story. Um, and the reason why is very simple. It's that second bullet point, QSBS, qualified small business stock. Only a C corporation can issue qualified small business stock. If you are lucky to have qualified small business stock and you hold it five years and then sell it, you are not gonna pay one nickel of federal tax on the gain, on the sale of that stock, up to $10 million or 10 times basis. We could do an hour on all of the intricacies of qualified small business stock, I will tell you that it is the biggest giveaway that you have ever seen in your life. Uh, and uh, the VC community and the angel community knows it very well. And they really wanna make sure that you jealously guard that. And even you as a founder, even you as an optionee can get this benefit uh, if you know what you're doing and if you do this right. And that starts with being a C-Corp. Now, not every company I form is a C-Corp. I will form LLCs, 
and um, I will form S corps even. Uh, I don't want to make this too tax intensive, but let me just point out that a little bit of thought ought to go into this decision. And here's a summary of the dis differences. LLCs and S corps, especially LLCs, taxes, partnerships, and S corps are what we call pass through. They're just reporting entities, um, except for certain types of taxes. And the income of the entity passes through and gets taxed to the owners, one level. A C corp is a separate tax paying entity, so it gets taxed at the corporate level. And it's generally worse if you're a C corp. I could go through the math with you, but just trust me on that one, generally. But um, if you can get the QSBS, it's not that much worse, probably actually pretty comparable. Um, so, like I say, QSBS is a significant issue. The other issue is that venture capitalists will only invest in C-Corps probably because of QSBS. So if you're the kind of company that's going to go out to a VC, you're going to be a C-Corp, okay? If you're kind of, kind of company that isn't going to exit anytime soon, and you're just going to be a lifestyle business and generate income year after year after year and pay yourself and your family and employ your kids and... Uh, you know, fund your retirement and just be there forever, uh, then you probably don't want to be a C-Corp. You probably want to be one of these other types, an LLC or an S-Corp. And I give the nod to LLC typically because of the flexibility. We can very easily convert that to a C-Corp down the road if we have to. Uh, we can do that with an S-Corp as well. It's just a lot trickier when it comes to converting and getting QSBS benefit. All right, don't want to spend too much time on it. You can look at that at your leisure. These are the requirements of QSBS treatment. So, and here's where I go through some of the math. I'll let you look at that at your leisure. I want to get into, I want to make sure we cover all the issues we need to cover. Maybe we'll circle back to this if we have time. California labor laws. Um, yeah, you'll be surprised. All right. If uh, if you're from out of state and you come to California, um, Cal uh, and I'm a California lawyer. I'm licensed in six states, but I, you know, I sit in California in Palo Alto, so I tend to focus on this more than anybody else. Uh, but number one biggest issue for startups when it comes to labor law, uh, number one is misclassification. People say, well, gee, employees are really tough. It's tough to have an employee in California. It costs me an extra 30% on average. I think instead, I'm just going to have a bunch of independent contractors that are not employees. Well, be careful because the state of California is wise to that trick. And um, they will come in and say, the, the, our EDD, we call it, they will come in and they will say, hey, look, uh, company, uh, you've misclassified those people. Those independent contractors, they're not contractors, they're employees. Right? So that means you owe us some taxes, you owe us some penalties. Uh, and if it's the employee who comes and makes that claim, they say, you owe me some overtime, you owe me waiting time penalties, you owe me lunch breaks, meal breaks, you know, on and on and on. Um, plus my attorney's fees, uh, if I happen to be right. So those are the statutes that are not codified in our labor code, AB5 and AB2257. Uh, that incorporate this test we used to call the uh, dynamics test, and we still do. Uh, and it, it basically classifies a person as an employee if the service they're performing for you is in the same line of business as you're in. So let's use an example. If I'm a company and I, with almost 100 exceptions in the statute. So it's hard for me to generalize here, but I want to give you an example of what I mean. Uh, if I'm in the business of providing wedding planning services, we'll say, I don't think there's an exemption for that, but there could be by the time, you know, <laughs> this gets published. If I'm in a business of providing wed um, <clears throat> wedding planning services, and I hire somebody, uh, even on a very sporadic part-time basis, to go plan a wedding uh, for one of my company's clients, well, they're my employee under that test, the dynamics test. Let me give you a better example, because this is one that an EDD, that's an um, uh, from the state of California employment division, uh, used for me. He said, look, you're a lawyer. Uh, suppose you've got a deposition downtown and you can't make it. 
So you just hire a lawyer, you know, across the street to go cover it for you. You're covered by this definition. They are performing a service that is directly in the course of your business. Now, why would we have a rule like that? California has that rule because we're going after ride share, right? <clears throat> You're a big ride share company. You hire drivers. Uh, you treat them all as contractors, right? So California, this whole movement started in California wanted those drivers to get the protections of California employment law, even though I couldn't find very many drivers who actually wanted those protections, something being forced on them uh, by uh, well-meaning, uh, but probably uh, uninformed legislators. But anyway, we have it. They managed to get an exception because um, the rideshare companies put it to the voters and the voters said, no, we don't want that. <laughs> uh, so now we end up with a law that applies to pretty much everybody but them. Uh, but in the meantime, everybody with a lobby managed to carve out an exception, including us lawyers, right? So I don't have to worry about this law, but you might have to. So the point of it is, a person can be sitting here in California, could be um, up in uh, Lake Tahoe, California, uh, doing something, and they are automatically an employee under this test. They step across the state line and uh, perform that exact same service for the exact same party in Incline Village, Nevada, and they're no longer an employee, they're a contractor. It's that ridiculous. So that's what we've got going on. Now, why am I spending so much time on this? First of all, because it is such a big issue. This is an issue that will tank your company if you get this wrong. This is one place where you absolutely do need legal advice. You don't want to misclassify. And, and I know a lot of you are sitting there saying, well, don't worry about me. I'm not in California. I'm in Nevada or someplace else. I left during COVID. I went to Florida. I got to tell you, the Biden plan, which is attached, just loves the California rule uh, without any exceptions, and would like to make that the law of the land federally. And in fact, the Biden administration has started to do that, uh, both through the FTC, as well as through the Department of Labor, uh, that we'll talk about later, they're starting to, uh, um, to nationalize a lot of California's rules. So it'd be wise, it would be, it'd behoove you to pay attention to what California is doing, because there will come a time, I think, when it may become the federal law of the land. Workers' comp, uh, if you get misclassification wrong for IRS uh, um, and the employment division, you know, okay, you owe them a little bit of, bit of money. If you get it wrong for workers' comp, there's potential criminal penalties. Criminal, criminal means jail, just so you know, so we're clear. Class action lawsuits, you get it wrong, any employee can sue on behalf of all the other employees. That's a class action. That's why I say this is an issue that will tank you. Go Google Homejoy. You don't believe me. Here's a company raised $40 million of venture. Uh, they, were, they were an online platform uh, for uh, house, house cleaners, housekeepers, one class action lawsuit. They weren't able to raise any more money and everybody lost. Not only the housekeepers who no longer had a job, the investors lost, the founders lost, the employees lost. Um, now, before we leave this, um, I do want to mention uh, if you think that's bad, <laughs> just wait till you see what's coming down the pike. Uh, California has a lot of new labor laws. Um, we could spend an hour on that. Uh, in fact, uh, California even had a law last year that the Supreme Court struck down. They said, you can't do that. That's unconstitutional. But uh, our legislature is a busy group. They're an active bunch. They're quite activist as well, and they're still at it. So we've got a lot of new laws. There's new laws relating to paid sick leave. There's new laws relating to uh, um, leave uh, for, for pay for absence for reproductive loss. There's laws relating to workplace violence plans. I'm not saying any of these are bad. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying it's a highly regulated area. There are a lot of new laws. So if you're going to have employees... Once you reach a certain threshold, you have to comply with this. So you want to know about it. You absolutely need employment law advice. The one I do want to call out in particular, though, is AB 1076. This is one you might have heard about uh, in the news lately. This is a law that you could say it codifies existing California case law regarding non-compete agreements. Now, everybody knows that in California, non-competes are unenforceable and void except in connection with the sale of the goodwill of a business, right? 
So in California, you don't sign people up to a non-compete when they come to work for your company. You would in Texas, you would in Minnesota, you wouldn't do that in California. That's that's completely void. And some courts have gone so far as to say, gee, if you try to enforce that, that's an unfair trade practice. Well, that's now been codified. You absolutely do not want to do that. It was illegal before. It's even more illegal now. And you could really get dinged uh, by putting those sorts of clauses in an agreement. Not only that, employers have to notify their employees if they um, if they do have such a clause. Uh, it's it's a, a statute worth Googling and taking a look at. Um, there are some exceptions uh, to, to some of these provisions. It doesn't make non-competes valid, but there are some exceptions to the punitive provisions of this, of this law. But this is an area you want to be super careful about. I tend to take a conservative approach. I protect the company's confidential information really carefully, uh, but I tend to shy away if I can uh, or at least tailor very carefully things like non-solicits. You know what a non-solicit is? It says, hey, after you leave, you're not going to solicit. Uh, my employees, uh, yeah, okay, I get that. My customers, well, hold on, that's starting to sound like a non-compete. Um, so let's be super careful. How about we say, you're not going to use any of my confidential information in order to solicit these people, right? Like their like customer specs, name, address, telephone number, uh, email address, et cetera. So there's ways to finesse this, but forewarned is forearmed, right? Intellectual property. Um, I work with tech companies. I'm in Palo Alto, heart of Silicon Valley. Everybody's a tech company or at least a technology enabled company. And in IP is very, very important. So let's talk a little bit about intellectual property. I'm not an IP lawyer. Just like I'm not an employment lawyer, I just know how to walk down the hall and find one when I need one. Uh, so, uh, but I do want to tell you the kinds of issues you should just be aware of. Number one, we've already talked about the confidential information agreement and invention assignment, sometimes called proprietary information agreement and invention assignment. Okay, so we won't spend much more time on that, but you absolutely have to have that. All right. Um, we talked about broadly drafted invention assignments. We want to have that schedule on the back that shows the judge that people really thought about this and it wasn't some casual piece of paper they weren't, weren't, weren't taking seriously. Now, I want to talk about trade secrets, uh, and I want to talk more about it in a minute. But for now, uh, suffice it to say that we now have a, well, now, it seems like yesterday, but it's probably been eight years now. We have a Federal Defend Trade Secrets Act. Uh, so we have state law of trade secrets and we have federal law of trade secrets. Why do we care? Why do we need two laws? The federal law has some teeth in it. You can get punitive damages under the federal law, provided your documents are drafted properly, right? right? There's things called whistleblower protections, clauses that have to be in the documents. If you want to shift uh, fees, anyway, you want to shift attorney's fees uh, in these cases. So it's worth making sure that you comply not only with the state law of trade secret, but also the federal law. Let me say a little bit about patents. Um, everybody knows that patents are valuable, right? Uh, at least my patent lawyer partners seem to think so, and I think they are too. A patent is the right to prevent somebody else from practicing your invention. It's really a good thing to have uh, if you can get them. It does enhance your value, but let me just kind of give you a big picture because I could bore you to death with how, you know how long you know how you get a patent, blah blah blah. Uh, and rather, I'd rather let you step step back and take the business slash legal look at this, because the question I always get is, gee, do I really want to patent that or should I just rely on trade secret? Because if I patent it, then, you know, everybody in the world is going to see it. That's public. And they might just go in French and say, what are you going to do? Sue me. I'm a big company. You're a startup. You're not going to sue me. I'm just going to copy it. Yeah. You know, first of all, that does that happens more in our imaginations than in reality. I mean, what company really wants to knowingly infringe a patent, right? They're gonna set themselves up for uh, punitive damages if they do something like that. But, you know, I understand the concern. Uh, the bigger concern is they're just gonna figure out how you do it and then design around it or do something that's uh, similar. And 
that's why people say, I'm going to rely on trade secrets so no one knows. And everybody talks about the famous, you know, Coca-Cola where, you know, it's all under lock and key and like, you know, the, the two people, the people who know how to do it, they can't be on the same plane together at the same time and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I don't think it's that hard to reverse engineer Coke, but let's assume that it is. I mean, it's just sugar water, you know, <clears throat> it's, and there's all, there's all different varieties of sugar water out there making us all sick. So uh, I'm not sure it's that difficult, but let's suppose that it is. Um, if it truly is something that's super hard to reverse engineer, then I might rely on trade secret, you know, so if that formula really is hard to revert, meaning that it's really hard for anyone to figure out without me telling them how to do it, then yeah, I'm going to rely on trade secret. If it's pretty easy to figure out, once you see the thing, you just take it apart and it's like, oh, so that's how you do that. Well, then I'm going to patent it because I want to get, I want to protect it that way. That's kind of how I look at it. Now, um, why, why would you not, you know, what's the other advantage of trade secret? Patents have a shelf life. They expire, right? If the Coca-Cola formula had been patented 100 years ago or whenever it was, when it was invented, then um, that patent would have expired a long time ago and it'd be in the public domain. And unless, and, and it would not have had trade secret protection because it's out there. So they would have no protection. Uh, I mean, the company, kinds of companies I work with don't really worry too much about that, but it is something to think about. The bigger issue is, you know, gee, are they going to find out what I'm doing? And if they do, am I going to have a way to stop them? So just sort of think of it. When you think about strategy, think of it in that sense. There's a lot of other things we could say about patent, trade secret, and copyright strategy, just intellectual property strategy. Generally, I cover quite a bit of it in my book if you want to take a deeper dive. But for now, that's kind of the big issue because the question I always get is, gee, should I bother with a patent or should I just rely on trade secret? Let's decide you, you well, and usually the answer is both, right? You patent the stuff that's easily um, discoverable, you trade secret the stuff that's hard to reverse engineer, and that changes all the time, right? Trade secret, you can protect things that are constantly changing. Patents, you really can't. You know, you file it and whatever the claim is. So let's talk about trade secret. Trade secret is by far the most valuable asset that most of my clients own. Um, so what is a trade secret? Well, first of all, it's got to be secret. <laughs> all right. Secondly, it's got to have value that derives from not being known, okay, like a process, you know, a device, a method, a technique. Probably should move that parenthetical down one. And thirdly, and this is the one that gets everyone in trouble, is the subject of reasonable efforts to maintain its secrecy. So let's parse this a little bit because this is super duper important. Um, the secret part, uh, okay, that's obvious. Uh, the value part, that's obvious, right? If, uh, you know, it's, it's only valuable because you can do it and they can't, someone else can't, it's a secret sauce. But that reasonable efforts is what it really takes to make it a trade secret that you don't lose protection, right? And what, if you've got trade secret protection, you can keep, keep in mind, the value is you keep other people from doing it, right? And if you don't have trade secret protection, you don't have the right to keep other people from using it. Therefore, you do not have legal ownership. Okay, reasonable efforts. Number one, NDA, right? As a legal matter, we want an NDA. Uh, the NDA is a reasonable effort to maintain its secrecy. If you let somebody see your trade secret and you don't swear them to secrecy, well, I don't know if you've, you know, if, if, you, if you've taken reasonable efforts to maintain its secrecy. Secondly, kind of good security, right? Remember the Coca-Cola, the two people who have the key can't be on the same plane at the same time. I guess that's not quite a good example, but maintaining secrecy. That's uh, that's the second thing, uh, security, right? You want to protect the actual. And the way we do it as a, as a practical matter in the real world uh, is through a good trade secret policy. That says you check it out. You know, you, if, if you have access to the secret documents, you have to check it out. No one person has everything, you know, that sort of thing. And then thirdly, I think good cybersecurity. You don't want to get hacked. You know, a hacker, you know, might end up blowing your trade secret protection. So um, 
yeah, be careful about this. It's a super valuable asset and it's so fragile. People don't realize how fragile this asset is. Uh, as an example, there's kind of a famous case where um, some company had a big Zoom call uh, where they they talked about, they had slides up like mine and they disclosed some of their trade secrets and the their Zoom settings made it open to the public. And a court said, hey, you just lost all your trade secret protection for everything that was disclosed in those slides because it's open to the public. You know, no efforts to maintain secrecy. So this is a fragile asset. It's a valuable asset. Be super careful about it. All right, we're halfway through my slides. Um, yeah, we talked a little bit about this. Trade secrets, uh, it uh, doesn't have to be patentable, so it doesn't have to be non-obvious. Uh, we don't have to file anything with the government. It doesn't cost nearly as much as a patent. Uh, we don't have to make a disclosure. This is a big one. It can evolve, it can change. A patent filing really can't. You gotta go file new patents. Lasts forever, not patents. Um, and a trade secret can extend to improvements that derive from the trade secrets. There are some real advantages to it. Um, and those are the disadvantages. The biggest one is its fragility, I think. Uh, and I'll add a third thing is that investors like patents. You know, if you got patents, you, you know, some value, valuation people like them. You might be able to, especially if they're good patents, you might be able to enhance your valuation when you go talk to investors. Next big IP asset that is super valuable and super important for a lot of my clients is trademark, right? A trademark is a design, a logo, a name, something distinctive that identifies uh, your company uh, as opposed to the competition. For some companies, it could be its most valuable asset, right? Because their goodwill is so wrapped up in that mark and name uh, that, because uh, especially B2C companies. So it could be super valuable and we want to protect it. And I see companies lose a lot of their goodwill all the time because they did not protect their trademark. When do you start protecting the trademark? Right from the very beginning, right? Number one, uh, when you pick a name that you're going to start putting in a logo or a design, and it's super easy with technology now to research. You don't even need me to do that. Um, but when you're going to start putting some real money into the marks, names, designs, logos, et cetera, that you're going to market to go out and define your company, your service, and your product, you probably want to do a little research and make sure there's not somebody else out there that's doing the same thing or something confusingly similar. So number one, that's a Google search. Number two, once you clear that, you do a patent and trademark knockout search. And number three, then you just go file a federal registration once you start uh, using a mark in commerce or, or sometimes you can do an intent to use, but get the federal registration so you can establish your priority. It becomes non-contestable, et cetera. It's a valuable thing to do and you want to get that button down. What you don't want to have happen is you don't want to go along with somebody sandbagging you uh, and get to a financing and exit some big event and then get a cease and desist letter that says, oh yeah, all that value you built up around that name and logo, say bye. It's sayonara. It's gone. So keep that in mind. Trade secrets, very valuable. Uh, be super careful about it. And the best, I think the best approach, and that's why, by the way, you know, pick a good name, you know, you think about it, the very strongest trade names and trade secrets, uh, I'm sorry, trademarks, the very strongest ones are not descriptive, you know, they're words that, that were nonsensical and now they're associated so closely with a company. I don't know, Zoom, <laughs> right? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Xerox, Exxon, Google, you know, just, uh, I don't know if those words had any meaning before. So those are the best ones, because if it's merely descriptive, it's not a very good trademark, might not have protection. All right. Um, you're not going to get very far in startup company land without hearing uh, the word, the dreaded word, 409A. Uh, this is an internal revenue code provision that forces you to go out and get an expensive valuation for your stock if you want to have a stock option plan. Um, and uh, uh, it requires you 
to grant those options with a strike price of current fair market value as of the date of grant. Now, what is, uh, let's talk a little, let, let me back up and parse that a little. So the currency that is most often used in Silicon Valley to motivate people is stock or stock options. Um, an option is a right to purchase stock at a certain price, and that preserves optionality. Uh, so think about that for a minute. You're an employee of a company. If you have a right to buy the, and a cup of stock is worth a dollar a share today, you have a right to buy that stock at a dollar a share that's going to last as long as you're employed there. Well, that's great because if it goes up, if it goes up, it'll exercise and you get the upside. If it goes down, or you haven't given a company any money unless you've exercised, so you don't have the downside risk. You got the upside gain, but not the downside risk. That's a great deal, right? It's a great deal. The value is built on stock options. Um, and of course, the IRS didn't like it because too many people were making too much money. And Congress uh, put in place 409A about, I guess, 15, 20 years ago. And if you mess up 409A, they make it very, very punitive. 20% right? plus tax, plus interest, but plus the state, California anyway, tax, you know, they take their bite out of you. You can't justify it. You can't justify the cost of not complying with 409A. So we comply. And to comply, uh, that stock has to be issued at fair market value and the current best practice is that we get a valuation to establish that. Uh, and everybody now knows that and everybody does that. So in order to grant options and we're a startup company, we don't have a lot of money for valuation. So why do we wanna do that now? We don't even know if this is gonna succeed. And if it doesn't, all this would have been for nothing, right? So my practice is, that we promise people options uh, at such time as a company gets a stock option plan, which will probably be when it does its first financing. And people will accept that. They don't get the option, they get a promise to get an option in the future. And the reason why is because if you never get an option plan, that means the company didn't go anywhere anyway. And if you do get an option plan, well, then you get this valuable option uh, at the first opportunity to value the company. So I think it's a good deal and that's how I typically do it. There's alternatives to that. Uh, I talk about them in my book, uh, lots of alternatives in fact, but I hardly ever do it other than that way. Uh, the second 409A issue, this is kind of a sleeper, deferred salary. You've been working and working and working uh, for your company and um, you're not getting paid. Finally, you get an investor. So you decide, hey, you know what? I think I'm just gonna have the company uh, defer my salary and they'll just pay me, you don't have to pay me today, pay me three years from now, pay me a year from now, pay me when you get funded, et cetera. Uh, I'm not saying you can't do, well, first of all, good luck finding an investor that's gonna let you get away with that. But let's assume you're a really hot company and you do. Uh, then secondly, probably not the smartest way to take money off the table as a tax matter, but let's say you do it that way anyway. But thirdly, uh, I'm not saying you can't, I'm saying you have to comply with 409A if you do that, because 409A applies to deferred compensation. And deferred compensation means that it's earned in one year and paid in a later year. And that's exactly what that is, what you're talking about. So we've got a million ways of making that work, but if you don't give it some thought, you will fail this test. It's a real gotcha. And um, now you're in penalty land, yeah. which is not where you wanna be. I definitely want to talk about securities laws. Um, in fact, uh, this is a really big one. Like I say, the order of these slides is not indicative of their importance. <clears throat> um, people forget that we have securities laws in this country. Uh, and I could introduce you to a couple people that went to jail uh, who forgot that we have securities laws. Uh, I, did, of course, did not advise them. Uh, that's why they went to jail. Uh, but we have laws, you have to comply with them. And by the way, you'd be surprised how easy it is to violate these laws and incur criminal liability. You just have to get one really angry investor to get the ear of one regulator. And here in California, that's a lot of people. That could be our corporations uh, commissioner, that corporations department, that could be uh, a local uh, district attorney or attorney, yeah, district attorney, a uh, local prosecutor. So you wanna be careful about this stuff. The reason it's so easy to mess up is because you can go online and you can download a form of safe or a form of convertible note 
and just go sell it yourself and raise money because it's just so easy, right? Uh, in fact, there's a million sites that'll help you do that. Well, be careful about that. You have federal securities compliance and you've got state com securities compliance both. And complying with one does not necessarily mean you've complied with the other. Um, I won't get into, for, well, I'll just mention that most of the offerings you want to be to accredited investors. That's a term of art. They don't have to be um, in most cases in startups, but you want them to be. Um, and then you want to file a notice with, you're required by law to file a notice called Form D, although most companies don't bother. They just file state notices a lot of times. Uh, it depends. It's just one of those questions. I don't have any good rule of thumb cookbook answers. It's kind of a case by case basis, even though we sort of do the same thing in almost all cases. Uh, I will usually file a Form D. Uh, a lot of lawyers won't. They'll file, you know, they'll say there's no real teeth in that. Uh, we'll just do the state filings and said, I'm not going to advise anyone to do that. Now, that's all compliance stuff. That's all easy. You know, it's just dot the I's and cross the T's. You'll be OK. Um, the real problem I want to talk to you about are the recent fraud cases. Right. And here in Silicon Valley, this is a fake it till you make it kind of place. I mean, we see that all day, every day. People lie to me all day long, every day. I'm so used to it. Um, you know, and I get it and I understand and I'm not offended by it. I totally get that they believe it. You know, wasn't that Bill Clinton who said that, you know, well, uh, never mind, no politics. But uh, I think founders really believe the things that they say, even if they're not true. Uh, a lot of founders, they have to have a lot of hubris. They have to suspend reality. Uh, sometimes they will cross over that line. And here are two, three companies in the last, uh, two of them with one of them in the last month, that was sentenced, uh, but three of them in the last couple of years uh, that have crossed over those lines. Now, what I want you to understand uh, as an entrepreneur, because I know you got to be outrageously optimistic and I don't want to stop you from being that way, but I want you to understand the difference between puffing, which is okay, and fraud, which is not okay. And the difference is, are you making a representation of your opinion or are you making a representation of a fact, right? Here's the difference. Hey, I have orders from, ev from every big company in the Valley for my product. You should invest. Okay, that's a fact. That better be true. Uh, because I think what you might have meant to say is, I have interest from a lot of big companies in the Valley. I have interest. They've emailed me. I emailed them, they emailed me back. They said they might buy my product. They want to talk more. I have interest. So be super careful. So that one little word could get you in a lot of trouble. And I'd like to say that angels and investors, they do such good due diligence that they're not going to let you get away with that. And you're not going to get in that trouble. But all right, just go you know, Google FTX <laughs> and you'll find out just how good, just how, how much diligence is often do. Um, you know, it can get past people because uh, people are entitled to believe you, right? They're entitled to rely on what you say. Uh, and uh, oftentimes they do. Um, crowdfunding, uh, I'm not going to get into the, the technicalities of what used to be a reg CF problem, because I think the crowdfunding sites have all kind of finally figured that out. And I feel pretty good about doing crowdfundings now. I did not in the early days because they were always screwed up as a securities law matter. But now I think, you know, the dust has settled and we've, you know, everyone's kind of figured out how to do those. Uh, nevertheless, you as a company need company counsel and you don't want to rely entirely on the platform. Uh, because I do know that some of them will simply ignore the blue sky stuff because it's just, they view it as noise level and the penalties is not being that big a deal. By the way, the state penalties are a big deal. Some states, if you mess this up, you don't file something on time. It's like Simon says, it's very formalistic. You might end up giving your investors a rescission right. So this stuff has to be paid attention to. Um, just a couple of things. I mean, I've mentioned safes a few times. That is kind of the standard in the Valley for angel investment now, at least in Silicon Valley. The further you get away from Silicon Valley, the more you see convertible notes instead. Um, 
and you know the difference, right? Uh, a, a convertible note has a maturity date. It has to be repaid if it doesn't convert at some point. Uh, a safe doesn't have to have maturity don't in fact maturity date in fact they typically do not and um they're not going to get repaid unless you have a financing or an exit or liquidation you know it's kind of the difference and they don't carry interest either so safe is much better for the company note is much better for the investor uh, <clears throat> but even within the safes there are different kinds of safes and i don't we've been at this for a while and this gets complicated and technical and will put you to sleep. So I just want you to know that not all safes are created equal. And a pre-money safe is company favorable. A post-money safe is investor favorable. By how much, it depends. It might be noise level, not worth worrying about. Uh, or if you're the kind of company that raises lots and lots of money, for years and years by selling safes and selling more safes and a few more safes here and a few more safes there, it could be a big deal. So uh, it's worthwhile to understand what you're doing. And the commercial cap table tools now will allow you to do what ifs and tell you where you are on a converted basis. You know, thank you for that because so many times founders, they would use safes because remember safe, you're taking the money now and it converts to equity later. So you, unless you're, doing the math along the way, you don't really know. It's not on your cap table. You don't know how much of your company you've sold until you do that Series A financing and they convert. And then you say, holy cow, I gave them all of that. So uh, fortunately, you can do what ifs along the way and you can strategize. Um, series seed, early investors, that's a watered down preferred stock. Uh, usually the reason we do that is just to justify a price difference between our low price common stock for options uh, and our high price preferred stock for investors. You don't want to sell common to raise money. You just don't want to do that. Don't do that. Stop doing that because you're going to set too high a price for your common and they're not going to be attractive to your option ease. And then finally, venture capital. Um, I do several hours on raising money from VCs. That will probably be our next event, or you can find them on my YouTube site uh, or in our podcast uh, if you'd like. Um, but we have several hours on, on venture capital, ins and out, uh, how to raise money for venture capital. Now, I want to leave you, because we're getting, we're past the hour. So I want to leave you with one last thing that I think just people don't pay enough attention to, and that's personal liability. Um, most startups fail, just a fact. They just do, right? In fact, I advised many funds, funds with an S, they were fun too, but they were funds uh, that had every single company they invest in fail, all right? Uh, I've advised many more that all of them failed except one, and that was a successful fund because one of them came back uh, with a huge uh, home run. So um, when and if your company fails, uh, I want you to be able to go live to fight another day. And I have a lot of clients that they messed up their first time out, right? That just didn't work. Timing was wrong. And they failed the next time out. They failed again and again. It wasn't until a later company that they actually hit, right? Uh, I have one I like to talk about. This company is easily a unicorn, probably a decacorn by now, um, that um, <clears throat> the founder... Um, he had in the dozens of apps before this one that all failed. Uh, nobody cared. Nobody wanted them. He was able to walk away from all of them and do the next one. Now, he never would have gotten to the big, big winner, the one that made him a billionaire, uh, if he had had personal liability for the early ones because they'd have sucked up all of his time and attention and wealth. So I want you to make sure you avoid personal liability in your company. Uh, even though I know it's going to be a great success. But nevertheless, I want you to plan for this. So I always spend a little bit of time telling people what the big issues are. Number one, taxes. You got to pay taxes. Uh, this is the number one thing, employment taxes. People think they're going to use employment taxes to fund their business. All right. And uh, this is like the worst thing you could do because you, the individual, you have personal liability as a responsible person for unpaid payroll taxes, right? 
payroll taxes have to be deposited. They have to be made. You can't use that money for anything else. It's trust fund taxes. The government views it as theirs from the beginning. And if you take it, you're still in our trust fund money. <clears throat> and they will come after you like an avenging angel. Uh, and, 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 and I mean it. Like I've seen them go after bookkeepers uh, when, just for being involved in this stuff regularly. So payroll taxes, you can't play with play around with payroll taxes. Wages, California now has two statutes on the books that make, uh, um, uh, we'll call them officers of companies personally liable for unpaid wages, right? Uh, there's wage theft statutes uh, that we're starting to see be enforced now. So, you know, make sure wages get paid. Those are priority claims. California protects its employees, it wants its employees to be paid. Fraud, somebody asked me once how they could avoid uh, being sued for fraud in their business dealings. And I said, I think the best way to avoid being sued for fraud is do not commit fraud. So what I said, buffing, don't rep misrepresent facts. Fiduciary liability, you know, you just have to get good legal advice. You have to be careful. Um, we didn't spend any time talking about that today. I talk about that in other presentations and I talk about it a lot in my book because that's a, that's a, that's a sneaky one that'll, that'll sneak up on you. Uh, so fiduciary liability, securities law, you can have personal liability for securities law violations. People don't know that, they don't understand that. It's not your company selling that security. They're coming after you, the promoters, if you do something bad. And then finally, contract, read that stuff that you signed. Did you guarantee the lease? Your landlord probably wanted you to, right? Um, I'll tell you, um, I, um, you should have them seal trained, <laughs> not to ask you for guarantee, not just leases, maybe your line of credit, uh, your credit cards, if your company has them are probably guaranteed. Take a hard look at those contracts, avoid guarantees if you can. Um, I can tell you that I do, and I've known very successful entrepreneurs that that is just a red line uh, in the sand to mix my metaphors, no guarantees whatsoever. You bet on my company, you bet on me or, or not. Okay, that's it. Thank you. I'm Roger Royce. I'm a partner with Haynes Boone in Palo Alto. That's my number. That's my email address. Feel free to contact me if there's anything else you'd like to talk more about. This is my first book, Dead on Arrival, How to Avoid the Legal Mistakes That Can Kill Your Startup. Um, came out about 10 years ago. It's also an audiobook, And uh, it really talks about companies that have made really stupid mistakes. Uh, um, this is my latest book, 10,000 Startups, Legal Strategies for Startup Success, came out last year. It's also on Audible now, uh, and you can buy it on Amazon or in Book Baby. And uh, this book is the flip side of that. It's the stories that are a little less exciting and fun to read about, because uh, they're about companies that quietly succeeded by doing everything right and not making dumb mistakes. Uh, I do want to mention uh, that I have a podcast, you'll be getting the link to it. It's called 10,000 Startups. I have a YouTube channel called Roger Royce Law, uh, where I have over 300 videos, hundreds of hours of content uh, on legal startup issues, not only just legal content, but also very practical startup content, how to raise money from VCs, how to approach a VC, how to raise money from angels, where to find them, et cetera. Everything a startup might wanna know that I can help you with. Uh, you'll find our content. So with that, I want to thank you for being here, and we will see you next time.